Hey, this is John. Thanks for joining me for this video today. In this video, I'm going to continue working on Wave's Machining Krieger Super Armored Fighting Suit Mark III Recon Type Rapoon. And every time I say that name, I have to read it off the box. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll just call it the Rapoon. If you didn't watch uh, the first episode in this series, then you might want to follow that link somewhere up there that's going to pop up hopefully right about now to, to see that first episode. And it just covered the basic assembly of uh, the kit, which the way this kit assembles is pretty much the way most of the Wave Machining Krieger kits assemble. But that one covered the assembly, brush painting it with lacquers, and uh, adding a few decals. This video is uh, going to cover the weathering. Now, I do want to try and get a balanced look to it. And I have to be careful sometimes that I don't end up with a model that it's all chipping. And while there's other applications, the chipping outweighs um, the, the other uh, uh, weathering. So I'm going to try and do a much more balanced approach. And to get started with the chipping, I'm going to be using this Vallejo Mechacolor Chipping Brown. Um, it's a good basis for later rust staining um, and looking like steel chipping. It can also uh, look like composite chipping. And it's thin enough, the, the Vallejo Mechacolor line is thin enough that I, I like using them straight from the bottle, even when brush painting things like this. Now, as I mentioned in the previous build, or the previous video, this whole build is inspired by uh, Lincoln Wright, who was a studio artist for many years in Japan uh, with Ko Yokoyama, who is the, the inventor of the Machining Krieger property. And uh, Link uh, worked with him and helped develop the look of, uh, I guess you'd say, the, the modern uh, aesthetic of, of that. Uh, Ko Yokoyama had certainly developed that, and I think Link just took it uh, e even beyond that. But this is inspired by him, so I'm going to be working uh, in, in kind of a workflow that's very similar to what he documented with his Rapoon, um, because I just like the way it looks. And I figure Link's better at this than I am, so he knows what he's doing. You see that I've got the, the model split up into two just to make it easier to work with. And I've stuck this skewer in there in the, the bottom of it. The great thing about having it on this clamp is when I need it to dry, I just clamp it to the side of the box. And it, it will stand there and dry, and I can, I can leave it sitting up. And uh, if there's anything running down, it just, can, it just adds additional streaks. And then, of course, it's easier to deal with the, uh, the, the legs this way also. Now, I'm going to start with brush chipping. I'm going to be using this Wargamer character brush, a great brush with a very nice sharp point, but enough of a belly in the brush that it's useful. And if you saw the first video, I didn't, I didn't completely cover all of the primer layer, which lets some of the paint that underneath primer show through, which actually begin to develop the chipping. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to go in and I'm going to pick out some areas that chipping is already showing through. Like right here, there's a, you can see there's a, a good bit of it right there. And I'm just going to go into areas where I've already done that and extend that and add to that and enhance that chipping just as the basis for where things are going to be happening because it, it as Link talks about um, and I like his philosophy on this it, it saves time you know if if most of the time the the chipping process is you paint something a solid color and then you go back in and add all the chips. But using the technique that he demonstrates, your chips are already developed and they kind of inform you where to go later. And in some areas, you don't even necessarily have to put in chips. Like right here, it's, it's fully developed. It's already there. So I'm gonna go around the suit and as you see, I'm just, I'm just using a very light touch, almost letting the shaking of my hand inform how the chip is going to go on there. And as I said earlier, I have to be careful not to overdo this because I have a tendency to get chip happy. And so I'm trying to be a little more restrained, be a little more balanced in my chipping just so that it's going to be in line with the rest of the weathering. But I'm just going to go in and add these little chips in where I already see some of the, the chips having been developed from painting process. And then in other areas, if they're not there, I'll just go in and add them. But let me finish doing this and I'll show you what it looks like. All right, I've got a little bit of brush chipping in place. And I, for me, I have shown incredible restraint. Um, there's really not that. I'm looking at it going, there's, there's not that much. There's not enough. But... In trying to keep things balanced, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to force myself to do it this way. Because like I said, I, I usually like 
to put in a lot of heavy chipping, but I want to try and keep a more balanced approach with this. Now, what I have thought about as I've been working on this is all along, I can add additional chipping through every step of this. So if, as I, as I develop everything else, if I think there's not enough chipping, then I can always go back and add it later. And it just looks like fresher chips because it's over some of the staining. So that actually works. Now, what I want to do is I want to do a little bit of brush chipping. And again, I'm going to try and be very restrained in how I do this. And I've just got my brush here. I'm sorry, I don't mean brush chipping, sponge chipping. I've got my sponge here in a, a clamp and I'm just going to dip that in the uh, paint and then I'm going to dab it off on this paper towel. Now, these make very fine chips that are generally scale appropriate. All right. I'm going to stop there. Normally I just, just blast it all the way around. I'm going to stop there, put in some more here, but these, these make really good random chips that sell the notion. Well, what do you know? All right. We'll just call that. That's easier to get to. That sell the notion of chipping. And what I did, sometimes I do the sponge chipping first and then develop the big chips from that. This time I decided to do the brush chipping first and use that to inform where the sponge chipping went. Um, I thought that would be a good way to help uh, limit how much I'm actually putting on. That little piece falling off reminds me, I don't like articulation in models. I need to just start gluing these things together completely. But anyway, I'll just continue going around and enhancing the areas that I've already done. Now, I'm deliberately avoiding putting a lot of chips in places where I haven't already chipped with the brush. Again, trying to, to force myself to show just a little bit of restraint um, to, a, to achieve a more balanced look. But I'll just go around the rest of the model, and sometimes even on camera, and, and add in those chips this way. Now certainly when you're doing it, if you want to if you want to chip everything on it, that's fine. There, there's, there's no rules that say you can't do that. Um, I'm just trying to uh, do a little different style than I normally do and, uh, and, and, and you know make sure that, that I'm versed and comfortable in doing that kind of style. So let me continue doing this and then we'll go from there. All right, against every instinct I have, I have stopped the sponge chipping. I did do it lightly around all the way around the bottom edges of the feet because I figure, okay, that's going to get chipped. Um, you know, he's walking around. That's, that's going to get some chipping, but I did just a few other areas here along here, figuring those would catch things, hit things. And I'm going to leave it at that for now. And then as I begin adding, as I said, as I begin adding in more weathering effects, any areas that I think need additional chipping, I'll go in and do that because I want to try and achieve a fairly balanced look. Now, one other chipping thing that I'm going to do, and this is, this is kind of fun, but it can also be kind of dangerous, is I'm going to break out the heavy tools. Um, I've got this file here. It's a Tamiya file. I love this file. This is the greatest file I've ever used. It's, I'm not even sure what number it is, but it's a six millimeter file. And uh, I love this thing. And then I've got my hobby knife. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually go in and do some physical chipping. You can see I've already started doing that. I thought I had my camera running and I did not. But I'm just going to go in and I'm going to very lightly scrape along those decals. And I'm literally chipping them. Um, developing the chips this way is quite realistic because it's an actual chip. And then if I need to later, I can go back and hit some decal setting solution on there if any edges come up. But I'll do this around the decals to give them a chipped look. Because you can do, you know, sponge chipping or brush chipping over them with paint, but why not just remove some of the decal and get a, a, a truly chipped look? You can also do this on the paint. Like you can lightly scrape along and you just want to do it until you develop a scrape down to the lower paint layer. Um, I'm putting no pressure on this and I'm just letting this develop as it will. And you see, I got just a little bit of a chip right there and I'm just going to leave it at that. 
Um, it doesn't have to be a lot. You can do this, I primed it uh, a brown color underneath. You can do this down to that brown primer. And one of the cool things about this method is if you go too far, here I'll just do it and demonstrate it. If you go too far, well these lacquer paints are incredibly tough, but if you go too far, there we go, and you get down to a layer you don't want to, like see that light area that's showing through, that's down to the original um, Mr. Surfacer. All you do is you come in with your chipping brown color and you just place a dot right there. And now you've got a really well developed chip. So as long as you're proceeding slowly and I guess you'd say gently, this is almost a foolproof uh, method of chipping. Using the file is very similar. I can take the file and uh, let's say I want to add some chipping right there on that edge. I'm not putting any pressure on it at all and I just run it along until I start seeing some chipping develop as I'm working through the paint layers. And it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a, a full chip in that, that it, it's just a solid chip like this. Just a slight wearing away of the paint can make it look worn. So you just use your files, you use uh, your knife. Here, this will demonstrate it also. You see how I've thinned the paint, but I also took it down to that layer of Mr. Surfacer that I originally put down for the texture. Now all I have to do is in those few little areas is go in and just add some chipping to that. And that develops a really, really nice little chip there because there's some thinning of the top layer of paint down to the primer. And then there's the deeper ones I can paint in and it leaves a really good um, chipped look. So don't overlook physical damage to the model. I mean, you don't want to break it certainly, but using tools like files and your, your hobby knife and even sandpaper and things like that can really go a long way to providing some realistic chips. Now on the back of the fighting suit, there's going to be a plate that goes over the engine area here, and then there's going to be a cover over this exhaust. I want to really, really rust those because it's working on the assumption that there's going to be heat buildup, a lot of heat, and that's going to bake the paint and it's going to cause all sorts of things to happen. So these two parts, I want to really, really give them a strong rust tone. So what I'm going to do, thanks for working Blue Tech. I'm not having real good luck in this video, am I, with these little, these little parts like this. I finally took those side skirt armors just completely off. They kept falling off, so I said to heck with it. I'm just going to take them off. I'm going to sponge on this rust color, light rust, and orange rust. Um, it's from a, a set, a Vallejo set for, for rust tones. Um, I'm going to sponge these on just kind of randomly and, and develop an underlying rust, and then I'm going to do some paint over that so that it looks like most of the paint has been rubbed away and left nothing but rust. And then later on, I'll go back and develop the rust more with some additional materials. Now, all I'm doing is putting a little bit of paint on my palette. I'm getting it into this sponge, sponging it off, and then I'm just applying it to these plates. It's very thin paint, so it's, it's going to... Um, it's going to be a little bit transparent, but that's okay because if that darker color shows through, that's fine. But I'm going to give this a heavy coat of this and just let this kind of develop the base layer and then go in with the other colors over it, doing it the exact same way so that when I'm done, I hopefully end up with something that looks like it's very, very rusted. I don't want uh, there to be any paint in this initial pass of doing this. I just want it to be rust that's going to be coming through that paint that's going to go over the top of it. All right, I've done that first color and for the next color I'm just going to simply flip my sponge around to another side that's clean and I'm going to get that mid-tone of the rust, dab that off, and then just go back in and begin adding this in on top of the first color. 
All right, I went ahead and sponged on that, that light rust color, the orange rust color. And then I decided to add one more, this yellow ochre, um, the last uh, color in this set. And because uh, I thought that the yellow, the addition of the yellow ochre would just really sell the notion of rust. And I'm really happy with how these turned out. Um, there's going to be paint that's going to go over them. And then I'm going to do other oil effects to, to sell the notion further. But to, to me, that looks like a rusty piece of iron right there which is kind of what I wanted to, to go for. So just sponging on various colors and you don't have to do them dark to light. You can do them light to dark. You can do them in, in a more random approach, layer them on um, because rust, rust develops in all sorts of ways. So, so don't feel like that there has to be a linear approach to it. You can certainly just kind of go free form and do one color and then another color and then back to the original color and just keep building it up until it looks like you want. And the beautiful part is the more you build it up, the more you get a little bit of a texture. And in this scale, that texture is perfect. All right, I'm going to get back to those rusty bits in just a moment. But for now, I want to do some panel lining. And I'm going to use this 502 Ab Lincoln Starship Filth. This is a great color for doing panel lining. It's a dark, browny kind of color. It works very good whether you're just wanting uh, panel lining or streaks or stains. I mean, it's it's named appropriately. It's it's perfect for this kind of work. Now, what I've got over here in my palette is I put in a blob of the Starship Filth and then I put in just a little bit of thinner because what I want is I want something that, and let me see if I can get it up close to show, I want something that will flow but I also want it to leave a lot behind. And the reason I say that is I want this thing to be grimy. And I want this thing to be dirty. And so instead of applying a panel line wash and then going back later and trying to add in some oils for streaking and staining, I'm just going to do it all at one time. Now you'll remember from the first episode that I did not gloss coat this prior to the decals and that was purposefully because I knew at this stage, I didn't want it gloss coated. At this stage, I want it to be, it's, it's actually kind of a, a, more of a satin finish, I guess you'd say, because as you'll note, when I put these on, they tend to spread out because of the surface of the paint. The paint is not perfectly smooth, of course. And there's the texture that I put on be, uh, with the uh, Mr. Surfacer in that first episode. So, when I put that on, it's not going to flow. It's going to spread out a little, but I want that because that gives me stuff to streak. That gives me stuff that I can work with because like I said, I want this to be grimy. I want this to have, um, as I've talked about, I want to rely less on chips and more on the other elements of weathering to make this suit look beat up. So I'm going to continue on around the model, just adding this around the panel lines in any of the, uh, the angles like this where there's recesses, just to, just to add that in. And then I'm going to go back later and begin, sh I'll show you the process of how I start streaking and cleaning that up and blending that in. Okay, I've got those oils on there. And you can see I put it on very heavy. I wasn't very precious with it because I want to, I want to streak this quite a bit. And I want it to be grimy and I want it to be really stained. So what I'm going to do now and uh, pardon me if my hand is shaking. Um, I have, I have uh, some problems with my hands shaking just at different times of the day. And this morning, they just seem to be much shakier than usual. So if I'm jittering around, I apologize. But what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to take this, this synthetic brush, another cheap nylon brush, and I'm just going to go in and I'm going to be begin blending in those oils. Now this process of blending, it can be whatever you want it to be. It can just be touching the edges. It can be streaking things down like this and starting to develop streaks and stains. And it can be just general cleanup. It's however dirty and grimy you want things to end up looking. The beauty of oils is they have a very long working time. And so I can come back even several hours, maybe even half a day, and 
stretch these out, push these around, pull these around, look at it, um, decide if it's what I want, make changes to it, blend it in. I, I mean, it's, it's really flexible. They will dry. You'll, you'll notice this area. See this area right here where it's bleeding? They will dry more transparent than they appear here in general. They're, they're not gonna, it's gonna leave a stain, but that's what I want. But in their drying, they're gonna, thinner that's on the surface is gonna, some of that is gonna disappear, the color from it, and you're gonna be left with just a, a much more pleasant staining effect. So as you, as you work with oils, if you've never worked with them before, as you work with them, you'll see what I'm talking about. Because as with anything else, it just takes experience. The first time you do this, you may not be happy with it. I had somebody recently that, that contacted me and they said, I did these oils and I put them on and I tried to do it as you demonstrated. This was from another video. And they said, but it just didn't turn out quite right. And they said, what else do I need to do? And I said, well, you need to build several hundred more models. <laughs> and I was partially serious and partially joking. This is one of those things that you know, you may do it the first time and, and jump right on it and not have any problems. Uh, but you may do it the first time and it may not be exactly what you want. And that's okay because that's where experience comes in. That's why we do these things over and over so that we learn how to use these techniques. Um, you ask any of the best modelers in the world and they'll tell you, you know, that was a first time for them using oils, for using enamels, for doing washes, for doing dot filters, for you know, you name the technique, there was a first time for them. And that first time may not have been quite that stellar. So, you know, if you do it the first time, don't get frustrated. I think the key is, if you're new to it, start with less oil on the surface of the model and build it up slowly. Once you've got some experience, you can start putting it in a bit heavier because you'll know what you can get away with you'll know how much work it's going to take to clean that up. And you'll, you'll really be able to start making good use of them. But doing it, and that works with any technique, doing it lightly at first, just to see what the limitations are, just to see what the, the, the boundaries are, I guess you'd say, uh, will really help you. And also, if, if you're doing something for the first time and you see somebody demonstrating this, don't go too far outside of those parameters if you can help it. And by that I mean, you know, I'm using odorless thinner and oil, um, artist oils. I've had, you know, people contact me and they say, well, I didn't have that, but I had this. And they use something that was quite different in terms of, in terms of the product and, and it behaved differently. Even if it's, if some things are similar, but still different. Enamels are a little different than oils. Odorless thinner, uh, works one way. There's, there's, you know, other things that work other ways. So don't stray too far from whatever your example is if you're doing something the first time, if you can help it. Because one of the things that you're fighting whenever you're trying a new technique is you're trying to gain knowledge of those materials being used. So factoring that in, I think, is really important as you work on this. Man, I rambled a long time on that, but hopefully it was helpful to you. I'm going to continue going around the suit and just, just blending these oils in, as I've shown you, um, hopefully on camera, and just getting it looking like I want. It's just a process of back and forth, back and forth, to get it looking like I want. And I'll show you that when I'm done. Okay, it wouldn't be me if I didn't say, hey, I'm going to show you this uh, when it's done, and then I break in and go, hey, I want to show you one thing. But, hey, I want to show you one thing. If you note right here, I put in a lot of the wash around that. That's where a hose is going to go because I'm expecting that to be a place that I add streaks and stains and, and you know, like there's liquid that has um, uh, come out of that, like it's had a leak. When, you're, when you have an area like that, I like to just get plenty of thinner on my brush and just kind of flood the area with it and let the wash do what it wants. You see how it's just letting that just kind of spread around there and it's making a really, really, really grimy thing? That's perfect. That's what I want. I'm not going to go in there and push that around or try and clean that up anymore. I want that to develop a really, really greasy stain. So 
I, I did this on this gas cap over here. I just touched a bunch of thinner and let that streak down. Now I'll add some later, but in some areas, um, if you want to really uh, have that have that stain, just go in and let me let me show that again right here because this is another area that I want to stain. You just go in and you just start touching that and letting that flow and letting it do what it wants because that process, um, that serendipitous process of weathering is really going to yield good results. Now, if it gets more on there than you want, you can go back later and clean it up. But you see how that develops a really cool looking um, stain there. So that's something to keep in mind when you're using these oil paints. Okay, I'm mostly done with cleaning up those oils. I say mostly done because what my general workflow is, is to do it until I feel like it's done. And then I set it down and I walk away for a few hours and I go do something else. It's Saturday morning right now as I'm filming this, so I gotta mow the yard and take out the trash and, and all of that stuff. So I'll, I'll let this sit, I'll come back this afternoon and I'll make any adjustments that I want. But I'm really happy right now with how it's turned out. I went back and added a little more wash to that gas cap. Um, you can still see it drying in there. I left it pooled in there. I let it really develop a streak down there, um, down below this. Um, there's several areas that I just really let it stain uh, around like right there. Now I can already tell looking at this that I'm going to go back later and probably make some adjustments right there inside there because it's 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 a little more tide marky than I want but I'm gonna let that dry so I can see just how much it is and I'll be able to refine that with just a little bit of odorless thinner same with right here um, I had quite a lot going on there on the arm and uh, I'll just let that dry and go back later and refine that a little bit um, as needed but um, I'm very happy with how this turned out you can see on the legs here, I'm really loving that stain right there. I'm, I'm liking that. And that was just, I put a big old blob there and I just put a big old dot of thinner and I just held it down and let it streak down. And that's just, I mean, it just happened. That's a real streak there. That's not a fake streak. That is a real fluid leak. That is oil paints leaking from that area. But I just went in and developed those, those shadows and stains. Like here's another area that I can tell I'll need to go back and do some refinement on, but I'll let that wait because I just want to see the whole thing and, and go back and refine it. But that's the beauty of working with oils. You can, you can leave them, you can stretch them, as I've said. You can, you can leave them for a while, you can come back, you can stretch them out, you can push them back up. I, I've done that a lot where I'll put a bunch of oil along an area and I'll streak it down to where it's almost completely away from where I started and then I'll use my brush to push it back up but in the process of pushing it back up you thin it out you, you leave streaks you leave tide marks you leave all those things that make it look grimy um, and it's just really a cool thing the only drawback is you have to give them some time to dry now I'll work over the top of them with some other things being careful but you know really the, these things you could probably still activate the paint a week from now if you used enough thinner. Um, so that's the one thing to keep in mind when you're using oils is they do take a long time to try. But it's only going to be a few seconds for you, but I'm going to go out and mow the yard, eat some breakfast. Well, I'm going to eat some breakfast and mow the yard and, uh, and get back to working on this and uh, we'll see where it goes. All right, while I'm waiting for the oils to dry, I'm going to go ahead and work on these rusted parts that I showed earlier. Now, my plan is to do some hairspray chipping. I'm going to put a couple of coats of hairspray on here. Then I'm going to put down, um, it's actually going to be Tamiya XF22, kind of a gray-green color. It's a little, little like a dark RLM02. Basically, I want to use that color because I want it to be different from the rest of the suit. I want it to appear as if these two parts were sourced from a different suit. You know, maybe they were from the scrapyard or something like that. I just want them to stand out, look a little different. So I'm going to hit them with two coats of hairspray, and then I'm going to put on a fairly, it will be a an opaque coat of XF22, but only barely. Now, when I say hairspray chipping, I literally mean hairspray chipping. I just use this Aquanet stuff. 
I've used the, the commercially produced modeling specific chipping fluids and they work, they work great. If you have those, use those. The reason I opt for this just simple hairspray stuff is it's so doggone easy. I'm just going to go out in the garage, hit these two things with a, with a blast of hairspray, set them down, let them dry for five minutes, go back, hit it with one more blast of hairspray, let it dry for five minutes, and then I'll just do a quick airbrush over it. So I like hairspray mainly for the speed of it. If you're using the airbrush stuff, go ahead and keep using it. It works great. Like I said, I've used it myself. But for simplicity's sake and because I'm kind of lazy, um, I choose the stuff that I can just shoot right out of the can. So let me get that done and uh, I'll show you what this will look like with the paint on and then I'll show you the, uh, the, the chipping process. Okay, I've got that paint on and I did literally exactly what I said I was going to do. I sprayed on a couple of blasts of the hairspray, let it dry for five minutes, another blast of hairspray, let it dry for five minutes, then put the paint over it. The, the paint has been sitting on here probably about five minutes. I thinned the Tamiya paint with alcohol. The only reason I thinned it with alcohol is that was just convenient. It gives a nice mist coat, it's really quick, and it dries really fast. I've used lacquer thinner, I've used their X20A thinner, I've done this with lacquer paints, with acrylic paints. The only paints I haven't done it with are enamels, and I've seen people do that with enamels. The trick with hairspray chipping is you want to make sure that if, if you want light chipping, you put down light hairspray and light paint. If you want heavy chipping, you put down a lot of hairspray and a, and a little more paint. You don't, when you're using lacquers or anything solvent-based, you don't want to put down a lot of it because that can lock out the moisture. So uh, this is only a light coat. It's just it just barely got to the point where it covered up most of that rust. And all I'm going to do now is just take a, just a nylon brush and I'm going to just paint water over that. That's just going to activate that chipping fluid. That's all that's going to do. And it may start pulling some of it off and that's fine because I want this to be heavily chipped. And I'll just let that start penetrating it. And then I'm just going to go, go in with the edge of the brush here and I'm just going to start working away at it. Now it'll take it a minute to activate that hairspray but once you activate that hairspray it's going to start coming up. Now the thing to keep in mind is if you use a heavy brush you're going to get much heavier chips. I deliberately chose this smaller brush with a smaller bristles so that I could get lighter and finer chip. When you're doing hairspray chipping, it's a little bit like trying to ride a pig. Um, you're not really in control. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard that saying before, but you're not really in control. The, you can have some control, you know, where, where you use the brush is where it's going to chip, and where you don't put the brush is where it's not going to chip. But sometimes it will develop big chips, and sometimes it will develop little chips. You never know what's going to happen. Um, it can have unexpected results. But you see here, it's just slowly starting to come up, and that's the way I want to do it. Now, right now, I'm bouncing it around. If you want to get a different kind of chip, you can swirl it around. Um, you can scrape against it like that. I've seen people take um, toothpicks and use toothpicks to get in little scratches and things like that. So it all depends on the effect you're wanting. But you just, you just keep the surface wet and you just keep working at it and it begins coming up and it leaves a really really cool pattern. Now the reason I wanted to do it this way is it would give me the choice by not using a heavier brush, a stiffer brush, it would give me the choice to pull it off, not the choice, but it, it pulls it off much slower than a heavy brush would. So it takes a little more time to develop but it lets me look at it as I'm doing it so that I can get it exactly to the point that I think it looks right. Um, one, of the, one of the dangers in doing hairspray chipping is all of a sudden the paint will just disappear. You see how right now all of a sudden it's, it's quickly disappearing. But this is exactly why I use this softer brush because I knew there would be a point where it would activate that fluid and the stuff would just start coming right off. I think I want to stop. Let me get it right there on that corner really good. I want that to be, there we go. I'm going to stop. I'm going to clean off my brush and I'm just going to wipe away 
any excess like that. And you see how that looks. Now I'm just going to set that aside and give that a little bit of time to dry and then pardon my reach while I go in here. And then this one, I want to be a little, a little heavier. I want it to just leave behind a little bit of the, uh, the paint to suggest that it once was painted. I've actually seen some builders that will actually just dip the parts in water. I mean, just drop them in water and then pull them out and begin doing the chipping process. So it's a, it's a very forgiving process, while at the same time it can be a little bit confounding because you can, you can real quickly remove all of your paint. Now the beauty of it is, if you do that, you just go back and you add more hairspray chipping, or more hairspray, and then you paint back over it and you chip it again. One thing to keep in mind when you're putting on the hairspray or any of the chipping fluids, they go on a little bit lumpy. So if at first you see lumps on there, don't panic. That's the way it's supposed to look. In fact, you'll know when the layer is dry when the lumps pretty much go away. You may be able to hold it up in the light and see a difference between, say, a, a matte and a, and a semi-gloss texture, but the lumps should go away when it's dry. And that's exactly what I did on this. I just looked for the lumps to go away. So that's how I want that to look. I'll just wipe off the excess again. Maybe dab that off. I'll give those a few minutes to dry and show you what they look like. Alright, I gave those a few minutes to dry and then I kind of sped it up with a hair dryer. But you can see I've been left with something that looks like it's fairly well chipped and that rust has developed under that. And uh, that's exactly the look that I was going for. Now what I'll do later on in this build is I'll go on back and I'll add some uh, some additional rust staining to this because if you've ever looked at rust, it not only you know makes that rust texture and the rust color, but when liquid is you know when rain goes down over it or something like that, the rust tends to streak from that. So there's going to be a lot of rust streaks going on. Um, in the parts around these, but I'm really happy with how this turned out. And I, I can't stress enough how truly simple this technique is. Um, if, you've, if you've been intimidated by it and you don't want to try it, give it a try. I mean, basically, you put down a coat of paint, whether it's stippled on rust like this or just a, a single coat of paint. You blast it with that hairspray or your chipping fluid. Give it five minutes to dry, however long it takes, five, ten minutes. Do another coat of it, give it another five, ten minutes to dry, put on your, your next layer of paint. Put it on just enough so that it covers up the previous layer. You don't want to blast it on there, you don't want a, a wet coat. Just enough to cover the previous layer, give that five minutes to dry. And then you saw, I just painted water on and just started chipping away at it with my brush. That's it. it, it it, the first time I heard about this, I thought that sounds a little intimidating. I don't know if I can do that. But I just dove right in and did it. And the first time I did it, I came away with more chips than I intended. But you learn how much it chips, how much, how big of a brush you can get away with, what's the difference between a big brush and a small brush, a lot of water, a little water, a toothpick um, versus a brush, a sponge will do different things. But if you've never tried it, I really... Uh, urge you to try this technique out because it gives such a cool result and it's just it's really a lot of fun to do. The next thing I want to do is I want to add some rust effects to various parts on the model. Now obviously some of these I've already done in such a way that they already look a little rusty like these but I want to add some rust effects also in areas where there's been chipping and around various bolt details and things like that. Because, you know, rust can not only form on the surface of something, but uh, like in the case of a bolt, it can be rusting inside and the rust tones uh, can come out from that. If you've ever, you know, studied any heavy equipment or anything like that, you'll quite often see that. So I, I want to get those colors on and, and give it, give it uh, an appearance that it's, it's well worn and, and beat up. Now, whenever I'm doing rust tones, I always, well, generally, sometimes if I'm in a hurry, if I'm being a little lazy, I don't do this, but I generally like to use two colors. Something that suggests a darker rust color, a darker 
orange and then something that's more orange or yellowish. You, you've seen rust. You know what rust looks like. But having multiple colors just helps sell the notion that this is rust rather than keeping it uh, in a real monotone color. So let me get all that together and I'll show you some of the ways that I add rust stains to models. For the colors, I'm going to be using some oil brushes from Ammo of MIG. And I've got this rust color here, which is a, a kind of a darker um, orangish brownish color, which is a really good basis for rust. I have this ochre color, um, also from Ammo of MIG. And you can see that it's just kind of an orangey uh, color, but it also looks very rustish. So it's, it's a good one to have also. For thinning, I'm using Weber's Odorless Turpenoid. This, I've used both modeling specific odorless enamel thinners and this odorless turpenoid from, weathering, uh, from Weber. I don't know if they're the same formula. I don't know if they're the same material, but they act in exactly the same way. Finally, I've got just a variety of cheap nylon brushes. Now to start, I'm just going to get some of my darker color and I'm going to begin applying it on areas that have a lot of rust. Now on this one, that's obviously a lot of areas. So this one's going to get a fairly good coverage of the rust color. But I'm just going to apply that on there. It's not thinned. It's just right out of the bottle, I guess you'd say. Now, if you're using tube oils, artist oils, those work too. You don't have to use these oil brushers. I'm simply using the oil brushers because I like the colors. It's purely a color choice. It's what I have. If I would have had the same colors in tube oils, I might have used those. So there's no magic about using the oil brushers. It's, it's not the product. It's how you use it quite often that, that really counts. And hopefully I'll be able to get this to work. But I just dab it on like that. And because these oils uh, take a while to dry, I can do a part, go back, do the others, come back to it, blend it out. You can do a section at a time. You can do the whole model and then come back. The main thing you got to worry about is just not fingerprinting the, the model as you're working across it. So let me, let me continue adding some of these oils and then I'll show you how I blend them. Okay, I've gone around the suit and put, and here's just a few pieces, um, and just put those oil uh, paints on the larger chips. Uh, you don't need to put them on every chip because rust indicates the age of the chip. A new chip can be dark, but it may not have rusted yet. So leaving some places without uh, without any rust on it indicates a newer chip. Bigger chips are probably going to have been there longer and continue to develop, so they're likely to have more rust. But it's whatever whatever physics you want to, I guess you'd say, want to, to, to use in your thinking. That's, that's what you'll want to stick to. But I've, I've put this on here, and now it's time to start blending. And let me just show you um, on this part here Hang on while I focus on this. There, that should be in focus. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a smaller brush like this, and I'm going to dip it in my odorless thinner, which I've got here in my palette, and I'm going to damp off most of that. And I'm just going to start blending that around, letting that bleed a little bit, letting it streak a little bit, now remember, this part here, we want a heavier rust stain on because this part here is obviously rusting a lot more. Now I'll just work back and forth to my center, dab it off at times to get the paint off because there's some of this that you want to remove. Some of it you want to blend in, some of it you want to remove, and you just kind of keep backing it down until you get it to the look that you want. The beautiful thing about oils, and, and enamels too, but I, I really like oils for this, is the working time. So you can just go in and begin moving these around. I keep saying the same thing, but it's just, a, a lot of people are intimidated by oils. And I've had people contact me and say, you know, I've I've always been a little afraid to use them, but they're so easy to work with because if you don't like 
something that's there. I mean, you can literally just wipe it away. It's so easy to use. Very forgiving. Uh, a lot of products we use aren't this forgiving, but oils really are. If I were doing this with acrylics, I would have to be much more careful in putting them on, building up the layers much more slowly. It's, it's, you can do it with acrylics. I've done it before. But acrylics are more of an additive process. You just add it on there a little at a time until you get it looking like you want. With enamels and oils, it's a subtractive process. You put it on there and then you take it away. So what I'll do is I'll set that aside and work on some of the other parts and then come back and take a look at it and if I want to make additional adjustments I can do that. Here's just some more examples of blending these in um, and I use the same process here that I did before. Just add those on there until I remove as much as I want to remove to, to sell the notion of rust on these parts. And you can have different levels of rusting. Um, there could be one part that is very dark, very heavy rust. And as you'll see in a moment, I could go back with the lighter color and add some tones to that and make a very light rust. You can also play with opacity. Um, one area can be very opaque, very, very well developed very thick rust and another area might be much more transparent to suggest newer rust while the other one suggests older rust so you can with two colors you can get a lot out of uh, of just those two colors you just keep working with it and I don't know that there's any uh, staying within the parameters of, of, of what I'm demonstrating here I think there's not a right way or a wrong way to do it in terms of color and opacity and, and things like that. It's, it's what you want it to look like, you know? The, the, the simple test is to, when you're done, look at it. Does it look like rust? That's the main thing. Um, you want it to look like rust. All right, now you may have been thinking, well, when are you going to bring that second rust color in? That's what I'm going to do now. Now, you can do this you can do the lighter and then the darker, the darker than the lighter. The, the thing is to have two colors. But what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to go in and I'm going to add some of this lighter tone, not completely covering the previous work I did, but just kind of adding some additional spots. Now right here where I've got this streak going, I want to add a little more along there. Now, in some cases, this is going to cover up the previous oil. In some cases, it's going to blend with it. Remember, this stuff still isn't fully dry, um, so the, the previous layer. So there will be some blending, but that's okay because that gets us additional tones. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to go in with the same brush that I've been doing this cleanup with, and I'm just going to go in and work it like that, same way I've been doing before and just varying you know more of a dry brush and maybe making it a bit wet just whatever I need to do to get the effect that I want and when I'm putting on the second color if it streaks a little bit if it runs a little bit that's okay because that's what I want to use for I guess you'd say my streaking color um, and let that run but you see it's really really selling the notion that this is a rusted part. Now I'll let that dry uh, for a few minutes and then go back when I can get up close to it without the camera being between me and this and and make any adjustments I want using my brushes in the thinner and maybe adding some paint back in. Another thing I like to do with this with this lighter color so there's a little contrast with the other rust tones is I'll go in and just grab some of this oil like that Put it on another part of my palette, come over here and just get some of this thinner and make a real thin wash. And again, you can do this with either color, with both colors. There's no hard, fast rule about 
how you need to do this. But I just spread it out until I get a really thin wash. And then I'm just going to come over here and I'm going to touch it around those bolts just to develop some additional rust color around those to make them seem nice and rusty. And what you can do is you can give this a few minutes and then you can go back and with a finer brush or just by streaking this develop stains coming down from that. Now if you want to just go over here and touch a few areas over here that's fine too. You're adding additional additional tones and colors and it'll mix with the other stuff. It'll leak down. You can even you know get a you can flood your brush and just see how you like the look of it and just touch it on there and just let that just let that run down. You see how that's running down there? I hope this is in focus. Um, that process of letting it run down is going to give you some really, really cool rust effects. See how that's developing there? So it's, it's a very freeform process. You just keep adding oils and wiping them away and adding them and thinning them and putting them on more opaque, less opaque, until you get the look that you want. When this dries, it's really going to look rusty. Another way of developing rust streaks is to grab either one of the colors. On, on this model, the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to use the darker color over the tan because there's more contrast and the lighter color over the blue-gray because there's more contrast. But you can do it however you want. But you just get a little dot of oil and you put it at the place where you want the oil streak to start. Like right there, just the tiniest dot. And then I'm going to go into my odorless thinner, and with the brush pretty much dry, I'm going to streak that straight down like that. And if you get a light enough touch on it, you'll get the streak that you want. Now if you want to refine that, you can start blending it in from the side, either side like that, just working back towards it and getting a stain like that which I think looks pretty cool. Um, let me do one with the, the lighter color up here on the blue so you can see it again. I put a little more paint that time. Didn't mean to. It just That's the way it happened. My hands shake and I deal with it. But what I'm hoping I can show, see how that streak is a little more pronounced. So I come in, again, getting some of the thinner on my brush. And I'm just working it from either side. What you're doing is you're pulling away the paint and you're leaving just the tiniest streak right there. And so I've got some rust stains. Now I can come again, I can come back later if I think that's think that's a little too too aggressive looking and just blend that in, sometimes just by tapping and just thinning that down a little more. So I, I know I keep repeating myself, but I mean this really is just a back and forth process of getting it like you want, adding colors and tones and streaking and playing with opacity and transparency. And you can get a really realistic looking rust uh, using these products. All right, well I've been continuing to work on this for a while and uh, you can see some of the rust streaks and stains and spots that I'm developing there and uh, I'm gonna let this dry for a while and go back and look at it later see what I think of it that's a process I encourage anyone to do when they're building a model after you've done a, a fairly major step set it aside walk away for a little bit come back and look at it see what you think I know that I'm gonna make some adjustments um, I'm already seeing a few places that I want to adjust and there will probably be more when I come back that I'll say I need to add some there, take some away. But I'm very happy with the progress of how this whole suit is coming along. I'm especially happy with how this guy turned out. Um, that's, that's rusty. <laughs> I like that. Uh, I really do like that. The only thing I may do is I may let this completely and thoroughly dry and then go back and add in some darker wash just around the bolts 
to give them a little bit of contrast so they stand out a little more sharply. But these heavily rusted parts, I'm just really happy with how they turned out. All right, well, I think I'm going to call this a video and uh, cut it off here uh, from any more work that I'm going to film for this episode. Um, there's still a lot to do. There's still um, fluid effects. There's still, you know, gas leaks and oil leaks and hydraulic fluid leaks and staining. I'll probably do some additional chipping. Um, there's the earth effects. Uh, I want to, to, you know, maybe do an oil dot filter kind of thing, some streaking. So there's still quite a bit to do, which I think will be perfect for one more episode of this build. Um, but I'm, I'm really enjoying this process. Well, thank you if you're still watching at this point. I know this one's been, as most of mine are, they're kind of long. If you're still watching at this point, I really appreciate it. Um, if you've not subscribed, please click down here in the lower right corner and uh, hit that subscribe button and the little bell icon so you'll know when I have new videos coming out. I would be most grateful for that. There's also links below to the social media that I'm on and also to my blog, and uh, I'd appreciate it if you'd check those out if you're on one of those platforms. And, and please do you know, connect with me on there. I like when I hear from people. So by whatever method, whether it's commenting in this video um, or, or any of those other things, I really like hearing from people. So uh, please do um, take advantage of those. And finally, there is a link below to Patreon. Um, I have a Patreon account. There's different levels of rewards there um, for uh, Patreon supporters. And I would appreciate it if you would at least just go take a look at what I have to offer there. And if you're already a patron, thank you so much. I am so thankful uh, for your support. It, it is a blessing for my family and myself because it means I'm able to pursue the hobby in the, at the pace that I would like to do it with the materials that I would like to do it. Um, because if we had to do it on our own budget, it just wouldn't be possible. So thank you for your support. Thank you for making this possible. And uh, I am most very grateful. And finally, as always, I would like to leave you with one thought. In this hobby, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Happy day to you, friends. Bye-bye.